Hey everyone, Derek here from a guy, a girl, and a camper van. Today we're actually at my mom and my stepdad's house because we're gonna be having a bit of a family dinner. But we came a little bit early so that before everyone else got here, I could take some time to troubleshoot a bit of an issue that we're having. See, a few days ago, we tried to roll down one of our front windows and we noticed that as soon as we pressed the button, the power windows wouldn't do anything, just didn't respond. So, as an electrical problem, the first step is usually to check the fuse panel. And that's what I did. Our fuse panel is located inside our glove box underneath this handy little door. And in here we've got a bunch of different fuses, but in order to figure out which one we need to look at, I checked out our user manual. So inside our manual, you'll notice that we have a little map basically of the actual fuse panel itself. And that corresponds perfectly with the fuses that are in the fuse panel. And underneath that, we've got a description of what each of these fuses are. So all we have to do now is find the fuse that coincides with our power windows. And it looks like that is this one right here, number eight. It's a 30 amp circuit breaker, so it's not even a fuse. But then we look for the number eight on here and it is right there. So bring our map over to our panel and that happens to correspond with this guy. And that makes sense. It's a big silver circuit breaker instead of these little fuses. So in order to troubleshoot that, it's a little bit harder than, than looking at a, just a fuse. But what I noticed is that this circuit breaker and this circuit breaker are actually exactly the same. And so I took a quick look to see what number 16 was. And 16, it turns out, is just the power door locks and relay. So that's not a big deal. I can pop that guy out and it just means that our power door locks won't work for a moment. So I did that to test and what I found out is that whenever I switch these two, the power windows still don't work and the power door locks still do. So that means that this circuit breaker is not the problem. That's unfortunate. That means we've got some other electrical problem somewhere else. So that made me wonder about all kinds of different things. Is there maybe a power window motor that isn't working? Is there uh, some sort of a short in one of the wires somewhere? There's all kinds of different things that might cause this problem. But then I happened to notice something else. I noticed that whenever we turn on our heater in the dash, the fan doesn't run. Hmm, another electrical problem. That's interesting. So okay, another electrical problem. Same step as the first one. We go back to the fuse panel and check to see if the fuse is blown as well. Maybe it's related, maybe it's not, who knows. So we come back to our manual. Here's one that says heater blower motor. That sounds like it's probably the fan. Oh, and it's the AC and heater blower motor too. And it just so happens that I did test the AC and the air conditioner doesn't blow anything either. So this has got to be it, number seven. Okay, number seven is right here. So then I go back to our fuse panel and number seven happens to be this 30 amp fuse, this green one right above the circuit breaker. So I pop that little guy out and as you can see, it is still connected. If the fuse was not good, that little uh, Z-shaped or Z-shaped wire in there would have been burnt. That's how a fuse works. A power goes into one end and out the other end. And if too much power happens to go through, then that little piece actually melts. And that protects your electrical system from uh, blowing. This will blow instead. And this costs like pennies, so it's easy to replace. But your electrical system costs a lot more and it's a lot more difficult to replace. So, because this fuse was still fine, now, I had to figure out what the heck might be causing both this fuse and this circuit breaker not to be working. Hmm, wonder what that other red fuse up there, the 10 amp fuse in that same row, I wonder what that happens to do. So I come back here and I take a look. That one is number six on our map. And if I go down to number six, it's a red 10 amp, that's right. And it powers the backup lights and the rear window heater switch and timer. So the next thing I did was I checked our backup lights. I turned on the van and I put it into reverse and I went to the back and there were no lights on. Interesting. Now we've got a problem with our circuit breaker, this fuse, and this fuse, which is responsible for our reverse lights. None of these work. And number five happens to be empty. So that one doesn't matter. Now that led me to believe that maybe we've got a bigger problem. Maybe these three are connected with the same power source and maybe that source is actually the issue. Maybe we're not getting any power from there. Now we got to take a look at this guy. 
the actual panel itself and see if maybe the wire that's connected to that row is disconnected or if there's some other kind of problem with it. So the first thing I did was pull out this glove box so that we could see a little bit better in there. That comes out like that. And this gives us a little bit better view of everything that's in there. Now I've got to pull this guy out. There's two screws that hold it in and they were quite a problem <laughs> to pull them out. So I've already done that to save us some time. Okay, so now I've got this fuse panel flipped around and you can see that underneath we've got uh, three main power leads that come in. This, this, and this. And they connect to little brass fittings which then power all of the fuses and circuit breakers on the other side. So there's a lot of tools that you can use when trying to diagnose problems with an electrical system. I have a multimeter that can tell me the exact amperage, uh, the exact voltage, etc. That's a really important tool to have if you need really detailed information. In this case, all I really need to know is, is there power getting to this point? Because there should be. And the quickest way to do that is by using just one of these simple little test lights. This happens to be a really old one, but it still works, so I keep it around. There's no point in replacing it if it's still functioning. So the way that this works is this pointy part uh, touches the actual electrical lead or the, the wire that you're hoping to have electricity flowing through it. And then this part right here is a little alligator clip that clips onto a, a grounding source. So something on the frame of the vehicle or lots of times it'll work really well if you even just find a screw that attaches to the frame and clip it onto that. And then this end has a tiny little light bulb in it that actually lights up. So if there is power coming through that wire, this lights up and you know it. If this doesn't light up, no power problem. So for this particular job, I found that the most convenient place to attach the ground clip is actually just to one of these little screws down here. They attach right into the body of the vehicle, which is attached to the frame, and that seems to give us a pretty good ground. So now I run the other end up here, up to these guys. Now you can see that light is not turning on there, nor there. Oh, but it is turning on there. That's interesting. Okay. So this one isn't lighting up, this one isn't lighting up, but this one is. Now, the reason why that's probably the case is because right now the van isn't actually running. So this one obviously has full power all the time. And that makes sense because it's probably attached to uh, parts of the, of the electrical system that actually need to be running even when the van is not. So that power is probably coming directly from the 12 volt battery. This one, probably only is supposed to run whenever the van is on, just like this one. Your power windows only work whenever the van is running, and that means that the power is probably coming from the alternator, maybe. So next, I start the van. And now we test this again. So this one is still on, a little bit brighter this time, which makes sense because it's receiving power from the actual uh, alternator to the battery. This one is now running, which it should be, and this one is still not. We've got some kind of a problem, probably a short somewhere. So now the next thing we need to do is actually trace back this wire to find out where the problem is. We've got, this is the wire here itself, and if you look at it, it's a black wire, and it's got the faintest little orange stripe on it. So it's a black wire with an orange stripe, and it goes that way. Chances are, because it only runs whenever the vehicle is running, it probably actually comes in and attaches to the ignition switch. Kind of like a light switch. You turn the van on, power now can come through here, all the way over to these two guys. Whenever the switch is off, then the power is also off. Now we need to start taking some things apart. First thing I'm gonna pop off is this plastic piece up here, cause that'll at least hopefully be able to let us see where all these wires go and then confirm our suspicion that they might be coming into this switch. So this guy's just held in with a bunch of these screws with a Phillips head, so I'm gonna do that next. So now we've got the top piece off. There were a couple more screws over here that had to come out as well. And then I decided to take off the piece that actually comes down here underneath the steering column as well, because if it is a wire that comes up into the switch, we're gonna need to have access to that. Those two pieces here I've just got on the grass. So in here, all of these wires unfortunately are all taped and wrapped up, so we can't really see what's what. After looking around a little bit, I noticed that in this little bundle of wires, that black one with the orange stripe on it. So that is the wire that we are looking for. And this happens to come up our steering column. And then on this side, it likely goes up into 
that switch. Now I think I'm going to have to actually pull out this lever as well because otherwise I'm not going to be able to take that top housing off. This is just the lever that adjusts the height of the steering wheel. Now these guys should just kind of pull apart. Yeah, like that. Put these out here with their friends. And now we can actually see the switch itself is all in here. Now it's, it's a mechanical switch in that you're turning it, but it's also an electrical switch. Um, and there's probably a little circuit board in there and a bunch of other things that I hopefully won't have to mess with. This is where all of the power comes in, this guy. And so hopefully if I pull him off, we'll be able to see that orange wire. So there's the wire, the black one with the orange stripe. I don't see any actual physical damage anywhere. Okay, well, we'll go under the assumption for the time being that this is okay, and we'll start exploring where this wire goes. So back to this bundle here, the wire splits off this bundle. One half of it goes up to the other side of the dash to the fuse panel, and the other half actually goes into this panel right here. Uh, it's pretty dark, but there's a little a little panel there that, that actually goes through the firewall into the engine bay. And if we pop the hood, we'll take a look at that. So this is where it comes out in the actual engine bay, this massive clump of wires. And I've already taken the liberty of removing all of the tape that was wrapped around all of these because frankly, uh, that was a really long, boring process. Essentially, it looked just like this with a bunch of old electrical tape and then underneath that, uh, some of this fabric tape as well. So after searching around on the internet for a while, I happened to find some electrical wiring diagrams for this part of the system, for this particular vehicle. And using them, I was able to determine that that black and orange wire that went up to the switch, it then comes down to this housing that comes out of the firewall and then turns into this black and pink wire here. And whenever I trace this black and pink wire, it eventually comes down to this little clump of really flexible wires, really flimsy flexible wires that attach into this massive heat shrinking tube that it looks like probably one of the previous owners must have put in. And then that attaches to this cable. After looking around a little bit longer, I determined that this cable is what actually goes down to the alternator. So whenever the van is actually running, the alternator is producing electricity. One of its main functions is to charge the battery so that the next time you need to start it, you can. But the other thing that it does is it provides electricity to most of the electrical systems throughout your vehicle. That happens right here. This cable gets split off into all of these directions, which then feed into all of the various systems in the van. One of which is this black and pink wire, which powers our power windows, our heater fan, and also our reverse light. So now I need to figure out, is this wire a problem? Does it have power at this point? Obviously, all of the rest of these systems that these wires go to are still working fine. So I know this cable must be all right. So it's somewhere between here and the inside switch. So before I got a chance to actually explore the rest, I happened to notice that this little flimsy wire that this is connecting to is got a big split in it. And whenever I kind of look into that split, I figured, oh, that's probably a short. I noticed that there's actually nothing in there. It's just empty rubber insulation with no wire in it. So then I happened to notice that all of these little wires that are really flimsy, um, they happen to say something on them. And what they say is fuse link fuse link well that changes everything so fuse link is basically like a fuse like the little colorful fuses that we had on the inside of the van the difference is that they're a much slower burning fuse they're essentially a really low current wire that if too much power comes through it over the course of you know maybe 30 seconds a minute they'll actually burn up and they'll stop power from going through so they're the first line of defense for the actual rest of the electrical system so if there's something on the inside drawing too much power, then this little guy will burn out. So I suspect this is actually the problem. Our fusible link has blown for some reason. All right, so now what I've done is I've taken this blue wire that I happen to have in the back of the van, and I've very loosely attached it up here to this pink wire, and then here to the positive terminal of the battery. So that means now that the uh, electrical power from the actual battery should be powering into this uh, wire the same way that the alternator would normally whenever the van is running. Now this is obviously a really quick 
hack job. You wouldn't want to keep it like this, but just for quick testing purposes, this should be okay. So now I am going to start the van and see if that works. Okay, that works. And what about the blower? Yep, the blower works too. Now we know that the uh, problem is that fusible link. Um, again, there's a reason why that blue. I'm hoping it's just because it's really old and not because there's some kind of a short somewhere else. But if there is a short somewhere else, then that means that the new one will also blow. And, uh, and then we'll be able to determine that that's a problem and, and start investigating further. But for the time being, it's getting pretty cold out here. So being able to have heat in the dash is pretty important. So now, how do we fix that fusible link? So whenever you're working on the electrical system in your vehicle, the first thing you should always do is disconnect the battery. The quickest way to do that is to actually just take off the uh, negative uh, terminal. Uh, it's just like turning off a circuit breaker before doing any wiring in your house, same sort of thing. That just wiggles off, and like I said, we just kind of put it out of the way. So the next thing is this fusible link is a problem. So it's easy to disconnect it from here. I can just snip it off of these two wires that it attaches to. I'm not even sure where this red wire goes. He's obviously powering something that isn't working right now that we haven't even noticed yet. And then on this end, it unfortunately goes into this massive mess of uh, fusible links that attach to the cable. So my first thought was to cut uh, this part here off and redo this whole section, but that would mean I would have to do one, two, three, four, five, at least six of these fusible links. You'll notice here that we've got uh, fusible link 16 gauge. So that's talking about the diameter of, or the thickness of the wire. And whenever you're dealing with fuses, they talk about them in terms of amps, the number of amps that can go through it before it will burn itself out. These guys all just go with the actual uh, gauge or the thickness of the wire. And then the length of the wire also, uh, you know, changes the number of amps that can go through it. There's a lot of factors that go in. So the best idea is to basically just replace it with the same gauge and same length of fusible link as the one that's in there right now. So the problem there is that whenever I went to the store, I could only find like two different uh, gauges that matched up with the ones that I wanted. Some of these are pretty damn small and some of them are pretty damn big like this one. Luckily, I was able to find the one that I need to replace this little guy, uh, which is a 20, but I wasn't able to find most of the others. So what I thought would be a lot easier is to actually uh, splice in up here, further up on the wire. If I take off some of this insulation and then solder in a new wire that extends out to here, and then a new fusible link from here back to these guys, that should serve the same purpose. This is obviously not a professional job, but I'm not a professional. So now I've got this uh, piece of wire uh, stripped of the insulation, and I'm going to take this piece of the blue wire that I was using a minute ago, and I'm gonna just try and feed it through. Okay, so it's a pretty messy solder job, but it was really hard to do with that really heavy gauge wire, but it is nice and solid, so that should do. Next, I'm going to cut out these two wires that attach to the bad fusible link, and then I'm going to link in the new fusible link and attach it to this new wire that I just spliced in. Okay, so now this wire is soldered to these two. This is the actual uh, fusible link, and here is the old piece. And like I said, it's important to make sure that they're about the same length. And this one, I had to cut some of it off whenever pulling it out. So it works out to be about the same length as the new one. And so now I'm going to trim this extension wire that I added into the alternator cable. I'm going to trim that back and then I'm going to attach these two together and solder that as well. All right. So there is that piece soldered and here's a piece of shrink tube that goes over it and covers up that mess. And then this piece has also been soldered now. That's a much better solder job. <laughs> and here we've got a slightly smaller shrink tube that's going to go over top of that one. So now just heat those guys up. They'll shrink and there's an epoxy in there that seals it all up as well. And then the weather can't get in and it's about as close as you're gonna get to having the original insulation on the wire. All right, so now back inside again. Before going to all the trouble of putting all those shrink tubes on, I think I'm gonna actually just test it to make sure it works. I don't wanna have to pull all those back off of there if it doesn't. Let's start her up. Power window. Yes. 
Next, I will check the blower on the heater to make sure that it works. Turn that on on the dash. And it does. All right, so that does it. Um, the only thing that's left now is to uh, put the heat shrinking tubes on and tape up all of those wires and then of course put the dash back together. Uh, but I think I'm going to wait until after dinner to do all of that because I don't know what my mom and Paula are cooking in there but it smells delicious and I'm starving. So what are you doing? I am about to heat shrink these protective tubes onto the wire. You can see there where the solder is? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this little tube over it and then this heat gun is going to make them shrink. I like heat. <laughs> there you go. Now you can see that it's shrunken nice and tight all around it. So that's probably good. Now both of these are nicely sealed up as though they were the original wire and this is our new fusible link. Looks a lot better than these old ones but maybe someday they'll get replaced too. So now for this unfortunately I can't fit a uh, shrink tube over top of this because I don't I didn't have an end to slide it over top of like I did here uh, because I never actually cut this wire in half. So for this one I'm unfortunately just gonna have to tape it with electrical tape but it'll uh, if I tape it up well it should still seal fairly well too. So I'm gonna tape all these guys up as sort of one clump and then I'll go through later and tape them into the bigger the bigger uh, bunch. The bigger bunch? Where's the bigger bunch? All these behind it. Oh yeah. So, fixed the problem, tested the problem, and then tidied up the problem. I think we're done. That's my guy. <laughs>